Good afternoon, uh, everybody. This is a meeting of the North Yorkshire Outbreak Management Advisory Board. I'm County Councillor Carl Les. I'm leader of the County Council and I chair this board. Welcome to members of the board and any members of the public or media who may be viewing online. For the particular benefit of members of the public or the media, the main role of this board is to support and the effective communication of the test, trace and contain plan for the county and to ensure that the public and local businesses are effectively communicated with. Decisions of the board are purely advisory and its recommendations will be considered through the governance arrangements of the bodies represented, which retain their decision making sovereignty. The papers for this meeting have been published in advance on the County Council website. The board comprises representatives of the County Council, District and Borough Councils, the NHS, UK Health Services Agency, schools, Health Watch, the care sector, and the voluntary sector, amongst others. Some 30 members and officers around the table, so I'm not going to ask everyone to introduce themselves. I understand that Katie Corner from the UK Health Services Agency is with us today, so welcome, Katie. Can we now move to apologies for absence? And Patrick, I'll come to you, please. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Apologies have been received from Councils Mark Crane and Stephen Watson also from Richard Flint and Richard Webb and Dr Sally Tyra and also chair from Amanda Bloor, Jane Coltup, Simon Dennis and Mike Padgham for whom Andrew Dangerfield, Mark Copley, Nicole Hutchinson and Bev Proctor respectively are substituting. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, Patrick. Can we then move on to the notes of the meeting on the 29th of October? Are people happy with those as um, an accurate record of the meeting we held? Seeing a few nods around the screen. OK, so does anybody have any matters arising from that me that meeting, those minutes? No. Nope. OK, so let's move on then. Does anybody have any declarations of interest to make today? Again, I can't see anybody's hands going up, so I presume that there are no declarations of interest. And does anybody have any other business that they want to notify us about at the moment so we can plan it in for the end of the meeting? Again, I can't see anybody indicating. OK, so let's go to the update on the current position in North Yorkshire. And I'm coming straight to Louise for this, please. Louise? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, Louise Law, Structure Public Health for North Yorkshire. Um, so I'll just give the usual update in terms of the public health intelligence, the situation of COVID across the county as of today. So, Patrick, could have the next slide, please? Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. As you can see, um, looking at the lines on the bottom graph, um, North Yorkshire is actually tracking above the England average, which um, it has been for a few weeks now. Um, and that is, as you can see, not been the case necessarily for um, some parts of the pandemic where we can attract a little bit beneath or at the England average. Uh, what we're seeing in terms of cases across the county is still most of the cases in our younger age group, our younger population. And I'm sure when we come to our schools update, um, uh, Ian might want to say more um, because we're certainly working with schools and um making sure that we can support as 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 needed uh, to try and get to those rates down it's not obviously exclusively children and young people but we are seeing um the highest number of cases still in our younger age population um so as you can see the the england rate is is lower for the north yorkshire so england's at 427.1 i think that graph says on the bottom and then north yorkshire is at 545.6 and we're seeing Selby as our highest uh, rated district at the moment because, of course, that 545.6 is an aggregate, an average of all of our districts across the county. So um, picture is uh, perhaps not as positive as last time um, I spoke um, with a 391 on average uh, daily case number on a rolling average basis. So um, picture is that as it currently stands. Um, so I'll move on, if I can, Patrick, to the next slide. Thank you. And that just gives a bit more detail of the breakdown across each of the districts. And um, as you can see there, as I've already referenced, Selby, Selby is highest. I think before half term, we saw Harrogate um, go over the 700, seven day rate of 100,000 population. But as I say, we have been taking proactive measures to work and get messages out, uh, particularly 
um, to encourage people still to wear face coverings and in closed spaces or when they come into contact with people they don't necessarily frequently meet. And we've um, been trying to promote messages around uh, perhaps wearing face covering on school transport and in Selby um, encouraging uh, face coverings to be used in education settings in communal areas. Um, but I'm sure education colleagues such as Ian might want to say more. Um, just to think about those basic measures that may make a difference at this point in time to try and get those rates down. Uh, really try to strongly encourage as well people to wash hands with soap and water. I know this sounds like a very basic message, but it's an important one. Um, yes, it's really good to use hand sanitizer, but using the hot soap and water during the day to wash hands is, is critical still for helping with other seasonal viruses too. And we've also seen um, over the last sort of 24 hours, uh, encouraging people still to use a lateral flow devices, but also think about uh, when they're going to be in an enclosed space, perhaps testing before they go into circumstances that might be more higher risk. And that will, would be when somebody was in an enclosed space or perhaps coming into contact with somebody who may be higher risk of the consequences of, of COVID. So just again, thinking, thinking about the options that we've got around reducing the risk of catching the infection, uh, COVID infection. Um, so making sure we do do those basic measures still. Um, can I have the next slide, please, Patrick? Thank you. And this is our picture of uh, uh, deaths across the county since um, April the 1st, 2020. Um, as, as you can see, as has been the case, thankfully, for many months now, it is much lower than where we were at the peak. And I think at the last meeting, um, you had a conversation in my absence around excess deaths as well, and trying to put this into the context of deaths overall across North Yorkshire. And I know Dr Victoria Turner um, had that conversation with you, so we're happy to pick up anything as a follow up from that uh, discussion. But just to note that nine deaths have been recorded in the past week. And of course, um, as I always say, and will always say, just to remember, obviously, each of these statistics is a person from our community in North Yorkshire. And just to acknowledge that and recognise that. Um, just the next uh, slide, please, Patrick, if I can. Thank you. And that just shows that picture there on the, the picture of deaths across um, the weekly breakdown, the weekly numbers, the average weekly deaths um, across a time period. Next one, please, Patrick. OK, and they're, they're just the data sources um, that obviously we use and um, just to ensure that they're reliable data sources that we're using in order to get the messages across and inform uh, members appropriately about what's happening in the county around our COVID infection rate, but just some basic messaging still. And I know we'll have a comms update later on in the meeting, Chairman. But just um, for now, I'll, I'll pause and take any questions that anybody might have of me. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Anybody got any questions or comments to Louise, please? Can't see any hands going up. Oh, sorry, Ian, please. Oh, it was just um, to say obviously I do have an education update which I can give later at partner update or if you want me to contribute seeing uh, Louise reference schools at several points I can I can do that now whichever you think most appropriate Carl. I think probably appropriate to do it now Ian please. Okay um, well it's, it's it's just to say that um, obviously as, as Louise has, has said that schools are seeing uh, a significant and varied impact but it's by no means I, I would suggest the only the only place where there's continued impact but the impact on pupil and staff ab absence continues to be extremely varied across county as, as we're moving through this half term um, schools do continue to work with close and bespoke advice from uh, North Yorkshire team uh, uh, excellent advice where cases need to step up and things things escalate um, these can include additional lateral flow testing or PCR testing uh, uh, reducing mixing within school or considering uh, whether trips, residentials and things are appropriate. As, as Louise has mentioned in the Selby area, case, caseload has been more escalated uh, recently um, um, and is significantly higher than other, uh, has been significantly higher than other districts national average. Um, so in line with the, the recently re revised education contingency framework, uh, there has been advice from Monday the 22nd for two weeks initially for face coverings to be introduced in all communal areas in secondary schools. Um, it's a simple and effective measure to help reduce the spread of COVID-19 alongside the other key control measures that we've got in place in school, uh, lateral flow testing continues, 
and we're also encouraging vaccination to those who are eligible. All schools are being visited to offer the COVID-19 vaccination to 12 to 15 year olds. I'm sure we'll have an update on that later. Um, and in addition, all young people aged 16 to 17 who have not previously been eligible are now able to book their second dose through the National Booking Service if it's been 12 weeks since their first dose. So those those measures are all aligning. Uh, but as a CEO within the Selby area, it, it is an extremely challenging environment still within schools. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for that, Ian. Any further questions or comments to Louise, please? OK, I can't see any hands going up. So Louise, does that complete your uh, your section? Yes, thank yeah. you, Chairman. It does. OK, thank you very much, Louise. Can we then move on to events? And I'll come to Victoria for this, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'm just going to give a verbal update today. I have turned my camera on. I hope you can see me, but apologies if it's a bit shaky or if it's still a black box. But uh, hopefully you can hear me, if nothing else. Um, and Patrick, I can provide you with a, a sort of written version of this update as well to use in the minutes if that's helpful. Thanks, Patrick. Um, Yep. OK, no problem. So, I mean, essentially, the, the Outbreak Management Hub continues to receive updates from, from all of our district and borough council colleagues um, on events that are being held across North Yorkshire. And these updates vary between the different districts, um, but they generally include documentation that has been received from events organisers um, and any lists of events where there have been any particular concerns noted. Uh, from a North Yorkshire point of view, we then review the COVID specific um, elements particularly focusing on their COVID-19 risk assessments where they are available. Um, and then in light of these risk assessments, we then offer a generic and, uh, and also tailored guidance to the safety advisory groups and to events organisers, uh, depending on the local arrangements to improve the COVID measures that they've got in place for each event. Um, so the, the local safety advisory groups, who are also referred to as SAGs, um, are sort of the heart of this mechanism from a district point of view. Um, and they receive notifications of events that require licences um, or any events that are being held on public uh, and council owned land. There is a little bit of uh, variation regarding notification of other events that take place, uh, for example, on private land. Um, or in event spaces uh, if there is an activity going on but it's not a licensable activity. Um, to try and cover some of this off we have asked our district colleagues to provide us with any other intelligence um, around private event spaces um, and to essentially remain vigilant to any other intelligence about events on their patch that might not be part of the usual SAG processes. Um, so uh, at the moment and currently due to run until March 2022, we do retain regulatory powers um, essentially to impose restrictions or prohibitions on premises and events where we consider there to be a, a serious and imminent threat to public health. Uh, and we do continue to make recommendations to events organisers uh, on reviewing their documentation, uh, reviewing it regularly in line with any local changes. Um, but we do try and take into consideration the balance between public health and also uh, the economy and the sort of wider living with COVID environment as well. Uh, we did send some targeted guidance out for venues uh, around half term events a few weeks ago, and we have also now done some specific work um, in recent weeks to prepare for festive events around the Christmas season. Um, so we've written some new festive guidance that has been issued to all events organisers um, known across all of the districts uh, and also to any um, destination event spaces that are in each district. Uh, the guidance has also been shared via our, our Stronger Communities colleagues through their local networks as well um, to others who might have been missed. Um, the, the festive guidance outlines um, the expectations from us focused around five key measures really to try and make uh, events safer uh, from a COVID point of view and, and does clearly state the regulations that the council has to impose restrictions on events that do pose, as I said, a, a serious and imminent threat to public health. Um, so the guidance covers uh, firstly communicating key measures to both staff and attendees before and during the events. Um, so there's guidance on displaying signage, uh, on measures around hand space, space and ventilate, um, alongside providing, uh, for example, uh, hand sanitising stations and supply of face coverings. 
Um, there's also advice to help reduce um, or prevent prolonged close contact between different groups attending. Um, again, further advice on cleaning and ventilation. Um, there's particular mention of higher risk activities, uh, higher risk for transmission of COVID, um, which includes things like singing. Um, and again, there's, there's information on any associated mitigation measures that we might be recommending for that. Uh, we do continue to promote uh, testing before attending events, which fits in with the, the new government announcements in the last 24 hours promoting lateral flow tests uh, before higher risk activities, including things like Christmas events uh, and Christmas shopping. Uh, and finally, as I said, we do note the regulations surrounding the, the guidance um, and the point uh, at which things may escalate and be deemed in scope of uh, restrictions or cancellations. Um, so, as I said, the guidance is based on, on the key risks identified by reviewing their risk assessments from events organisers and our knowledge of the, the local and national picture of COVID transmission. Uh, and the aim of the guidance is to give organisers uh, clear and, and uh, key identical but viable high risk activities. Um, again, with a particular festive slant at the moment around things like travel concerts, etc. Um, uh, and outlining any mitigations or alternative arrangements that they could put in place to, to uh, reduce the risk. Um, so district colleagues have been asked to provide an up-to-date list of events that are happening um, in their patch over the festive season uh, that's collated centrally through Resilience Direct. Um, and they've also been asked to share any documentation with us uh, for any event that they are concerned about uh, and also support us in asking for documentation where we have expressed concerns ourselves. Um, so as I said, this is in light of the, the response to the changing prevalence of COVID-19, both locally and nationally, uh, as Louise has just set out, uh, but also takes into account some of the, the public's change in perception around risk. Uh, and again, I've already uh, alluded to the, the change in testing stance in the last uh, sort of day or so uh, around lateral flow testing, where we were previously recommending everyone to take a regular lateral flow test uh, twice a week. Uh, whereas now the language has changed uh, to essentially recommend a test if you're going to be in uh, what they're saying, what they're calling a high risk situation that day um, or before you visit people who are at high risk of, of severe illness. Um, so that's generally, again, when you're in crowded and indoor spaces or if there's somewhere where it's poor ventilation. Uh, and there's been quite a lot of media coverage about that in the last 24 hours. So hopefully that will encourage more people to, to take a test before um, attending any events. Um, so it's quite a lot to go through. The local guidance I've just referred to is all published on our website um, so people can look for themselves um, and also people who may want some, some guidance to support with their own smaller events. Uh, they can have a look and see what the key points are. So I'll put a link uh, to that in the chat box in a second. Um, and I guess <coughs> we said we'd update on some of the key events themselves. I mean, there are a number that we are looking at uh, across the SAGs. Uh, th th for ease and for time, I'll put a list in the box of the main ones, but the majority are Christmas markets um, at various towns across North Yorkshire, um, starting this weekend and running up to Christmas in some places. Um, I, I think, Chair, that that's all the points I wanted to make, but uh, Happy to take questions. And I also just wanted to thank um, Jess Marshall, who I think has been able to join us on the call as one of our health improvement managers, uh, who has been instrumental in leading a lot of this work. Uh, and I know it's been a really valuable link for our district partners. Um, so that's it from me, Chair, unless there's any questions. OK, thank you very much, Victoria. I'll open it up. Any questions, please, or comments to Victoria? Clearly, we're heading into a busy time leading up to Christmas. No, oh, it looks as if uh, you've given us all the information we need, uh, Victoria. So thank you for that. Thanks. Uh, let's move on then to, uh, and you, you did say you're going to put some information in the uh, I chat. will, uh, yeah, I'll add it in the so, box now for uh, you. Yeah. Let Patrick have stuff for the minutes. That's good. OK, thank you. So can we move on then to item eight, which is the vaccination update? Um, and am, am I coming to Sue for this? It's myself, Chair. Oh, sorry, Andrew. Sorry. That's all right. Uh, so Andrew Dangerfield, Head of Primary Care for North Yorkshire CCG. I think I'm deputising for Sue, who would deputise for Amanda Bloor. And <laughs> um, so thank you very much. Um, in general, uh, the programme still um, rolls on and we so the different cohorts of vaccinations we have live at the moment. We still have the Evergreen offer for um, first and second doses for anybody over 18. Um, we then have the booster programme, 
which um, was running for the over 50s immunocompromised and health and social care workers. That's recently been um, uh, expanded to include what was now cohort 10, so the 40 to 49 year olds. And then as mentioned earlier, the schools programme for 12 to 15 year olds continues. Um, H, uh, the community services providers and uh, acute trusts are providing that within the schools and that continues to roll out. Um, it hasn't been as fast as we would ideally like, but that it continues and is um, working quite well now. We then had the recent um, update to the guidance that 16, 17 year olds can receive a second dose. Um, and then we have the immunocompromised who will receive a third primary course dose um, at any time uh, eight weeks and beyond after their second dose. They will then be entitled to a booster dose at six months following their third dose. Um, it remains very complicated all of that. Um, and I have to keep checking in with myself as to who's entitled to what. However, um, across North Yorkshire and York, we've now delivered um, 614,700 first doses, 573,480 second doses, and now 213,985 boosters. So in terms of um, percentages, it's about 89% of the population is covered by a first and second dose and 54% of the eligible population has had a booster. Um, but remember, the, uh, the 40 to 49 year olds only became eligible for that a couple of weeks ago. Um, so they're early days for that cohort. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions. OK, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, questions, please. Ian, you're first. Thank you. Um, I I think we can all agree there's been huge success in the vaccination program, but um, I, I'd like to just ask specifically about the, the, the school based 12 to 15 program, if I can. The, the ambition was to um, try and complete uh, by the end of November, I, I believe. Um, and I, I understand there have been some instances uh, where it hasn't been able to complete on the day or where there's had to be cancellations. Is is the ambition likely to be realised or, or or may it have to de defer to a, a similar kind of evergreen catch up? So I think there is a, um, a not insignificant risk that the um, programme will need to continue beyond the end of November um, for various reasons. So staffing capacity has been an issue within the schools programme. Uh, but part of the programme does include revisiting any schools where there were um, pupils unable to be vaccinated for whatever reason um, due to sickness, etc. So uh, it's also been bolstered by um, some uh, community pharmacy sites in particular have been um, approved to carry out vaccinations for the 12 to 15 year olds outside of school hours. So they uh, have been providing that after school and at weekends in some cases, but not all are approved to do that. So we should see that programme start to pick up um, further pace now. But yes, in, in a sense, there will be an evergreen offer for uh, 12 to 15 year olds, not forgetting that every day we, we see more 11 year olds turn 12 and therefore become eligible. OK, thank you. OK, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Ian. Uh, anybody else want to uh, come in with any questions or comments to Andrew? No. Nope. OK, well, thank you for that. Thank you for the presentation and the information. Thank you. Uh, let's move on then to the communications update. Unfortunately, Mike James can't be with us today, but he has circulated a short written report. Um, can I just suggest that we take any comments on that if we just need to note them for the minutes? And if there's any questions, uh, Patrick will take them away and get and get an answer for us. So anybody got any comments or questions to the communications report? Again, I can't see any hands going up. 
So let's move on then, please, to partners updates and we'll run down the list. Helen, please, you're first from business and, uh, and the lab. Thanks very much, Carl. Um, just a, a few trend updates for everyone on what's happening with the business community. Um, the transport problems that we've discussed at um, previous meetings continue, particularly relating to shortages in freight capacity and HGV drivers um, and some of the logistical issues go back further than that to some of the Brexit follow through. Um, businesses are facing quite significant uh, pressure on input costs. Um, fuel prices are a part of that, but it's broader than that as well. And in some sectors, there are sharp rises in salaries, um, some already showing and some projected. So quite a lot of, of pressures on businesses in various different ways. However, um, there is still um, considerable business confidence. The business confidence indicator for the region uh, is above its historical average which I think is um, a sign of the, the stoic and passionate enthusiasm for business growth across the patch. Um, likewise, uh, we're also seeing forecast for employment growth. Um, so I think in summary, businesses are feeling challenged, but are rising to those challenges and are optimistic about the road ahead, subject to what we turn out to be facing in terms of COVID over the winter. Thank you very much, Carl. OK, thank you, Helen. We want to, is there anybody here from the care sector? Yes, uh, yeah, hi. Hello, Chair. Thank you. It's Bev Proctor from the Independent Care Group. Oh, hello, Bev. Right. Hi, hi. Yes, thank you. Just um, two uh, main points just to uh, make the board aware of is um, the continued workforce shortages um, across the whole of the health and social care environment continue to be uh, incredibly challenging, uh, creating lots of impacts. Um, one of the things the social care sector is struggling with at the moment is creating that capacity to meet demand. Uh, so we're seeing um, lots of issues around um, trying to source um, domiciliary care and care home provision uh, in communities. Uh, we're working very hard with the uh, council uh, and the CCG to look at alternative pathways and ways to work. Um, so, yeah, it's just uh, still a bit tricky out there. OK, thank you, uh, Bev. Can we move on then to Health Watch and Ashley, please? Yeah, hi, thank you very much. Um, just two, suppose two quick points, really. Firstly, that we, we actually we aren't, have, aren't, we aren't receiving uh, that many really calls around the vaccination program, which for me means that people are happy and it's and it's going well. So that's a, a good thing. Um, the major, I suppose, concerns we're hearing about, and in a recent report that we did, is is people's experiences and how if, how COVID is impacting on on their their mental health. So it's very much around, I suppose, uh, you know, delays in services, lack of access to services. But most of those are as a result of um covid I mean, so we are so we are we are liaising with the tzs weir valley and with you know, and around the you know, prime care network just make, make them more aware of that but that that's the major things that we're picking up on it's still that sort of backlog uh, from treatment that's causing um some issues for people really okay thank you very much ashley um any of my colleagues in local government want to uh, come in with an update no. OK, thank you. Um, Andrew, anything else from the NHS? Is... No, that's fine. Thank you. Lisa, police update, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we're not seeing any particular um, level of calls of service uh, in relation to COVID issues in communities. From a policing staff perspective, uh, we obviously have seen our fair share of, of officers and staff who have suffered COVID themselves and also are isolating if they have family 
uh, with COVID symptoms or, or positive testing, and but it, it hasn't been affecting our ability to deliver the usual policing service. And of course, uh, much of the online meeting opportunities that create were created during COVID mean that quite a lot of people can still uh, work if they have the sorts of uh, jobs or roles that can be performed remotely. Uh, so nothing further to report and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, um, Lisa. We don't normally take questions at this sort of update part, so we'll, just, uh, we'll, keep, we'll keep on moving with it. Um, Office of Police, Fire and Crime Commissioner, Nicole, anything from you, please, to update? No, nothing from us, thank you. Apart from you having a very important Apart election to from, first I get into one. I wasn't going to say that, yeah. <laughs> Apart from that on Thursday. And presumably promotion of face coverings will be there at all available polling stations. OK, thank you. Schools, Ian, anything else to add? Nothing further, thank you. OK, thank you, Ian. And Katie, UK Health Services Agency, anything from you, please? Hi, Carl, it's Victoria. Katie I just had stuff away for an urgent um, incident, but she's uh, quickly said, could I just give a very brief update from her perspective? Uh, oh, I think we'll have noted from last time that... Uh, uh, whereas previously referred to, to Public Health England, um, she just wanted to, to note that as of October, that has now been disbanded and uh, the, the relevant functions of what was Public Health England have now been moved into uh, partly into NHS England, partly into the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities and partly into the UK Health Security Agency. So um, it, Katie is our representative from the health protection team and that part uh, which manages COVID is in the UK Health Security Agency. Um, so they, they are continuing to support us as they have done throughout COVID. Also, just to note that they are supporting us a lot at the moment on avian flu as well, which I'm sure all colleagues will be aware of from North Yorkshire perspective. So there's lots of work um, from, and I think that's probably where she is at the moment dealing with that one, uh, managing some of the, the avian flu as well as the COVID we've seen in recent weeks. OK, thank you, Victoria, for that. And then finally, voluntary and community sector, please. Anything from you, Mark, please. Uh, good afternoon, Mr Chairman. Uh, we're continuing to work collaboratively with all sectors and in particular um, sort of on the communication side of things and making sure that uh, voluntary sector frontline workers as part of the social care workforce have access to uh, you know, the vaccinations, etc. and all the latest messaging uh, from uh, public health colleagues with regards to events and uh, how to manage those safely. So th thanks very much indeed. Cheers. OK, thank you. So can we note those updates, please? Um, there was a late question from communications from Nicole, but I think it's been answered, Nicole. Is that right? You're happy with that answer? OK, so that's done that. So that takes us on to the next meeting, Thursday, the 23rd of December at two o'clock. That might not be the most popular meeting time and date, but We'll have to wait and see how many apologies we get as we get closer to it, but it will still be important to keep uh, keep an update um, going. Um, and then there was no other business notified to us, so I think that brings us to the end of this session. So thank you for your attendance and your input. Thank you to all the people who give us the, uh, the updates. Um, and with that, I'll close the meeting. Thank you to the team for uh, making sure it works, the technology, etc. Um, and until we meet again, let's all keep safe. Thank you. Bye.